It's That's Lit with me, Shazzy D, here from home. Thank you for joining me. And we are going to just kick right off with another guest back again on my show, Xavier Mulenga. Xavier, welcome back to the show. Hey, thank you very much for having me. Always a pleasure to be back. It's good to have you back. And, you know, Xavier, you've been on the show before. Last time we had a whole chat about therapy. Um, and so this time I thought it would be really great if you could talk a lot about anxiety, especially with this whole coronavirus pandemic. I know the restrictions are kind of slowly starting to ease at the moment, but it's still kind of like early days, like people shouldn't be like rushing to go out. So if, you know, people are still having some sort of anxieties, I thought, you know, we could talk about how we could reduce it. So maybe can you, yeah, help us, you know, discuss kind of what exactly anxiety is and how we can kind of reduce it. Okay. So generally speaking, like anxiety, as we know it, is usually intense or excessive where we have about really normal day situations. It's healthy to have some level of anxiety. It's sort of a, a survival mechanism. You know, it's the type of thing that tells you don't walk down that alley, the anxiety you get where I have to study, otherwise I might fail an exam. So it's quite useful uh, in its general day to day. The problem when anxiety becomes uh, a problem is when you're having those responses all the time. So let's say symptoms of significant anxiety of a normal anxiety are, you know, heart beating very fast having trouble breathing, not thinking straight. People even get dizzy spells, panic attacks. And sometimes that can be within normal perspective. But if let's say you're having this all the time and the response is not equal to what you're experiencing, then that's going to be you know, the threat level. And that becomes a problem. And that's when you probably need to start doing a bit more self-care. Occasionally, maybe see a professional. But there are lots of things you can do to bring that right down. So, yeah, so you talked about, you know, some of the symptoms, but before it gets to, you know, the really big stage where, you know, you may have to, you know, call the doctor. Or, so before we get to that stage, what kind of yeah. things can we do to kind of like alleviate the anxiety we may be feeling at this time? Yeah, no, that's a really good um, question. So a couple of things I always tell everyone is actually going back in the context of COVID, mm. I think the biggest anxiety you get for people right now is the people who don't know much about what you know, coronavirus is, it's actually, then you start hearing all this hearsay, gossip on WhatsApp channels, this misinformation, and that makes people more nervous, but they're not actually listening to really good you know, advice. So generally, I, I always tell everyone, if you're in Australia, right, Department of Health website, if you just type health and COVID in your Google search, pretty much comes up. They literally have very basic information about what coronavirus is, how to protect yourself from it, what self-isolation looks like, They've got helplines you can call, information for parents and kids. So then I think it's somewhere where it's, you know, the evidence-based uh, approach they have is quite good. So knowledge is power. So that's the first step. So at least the more you know about these times, coronavirus, COVID-19 times, the better prepared you'll be, I feel. All right. Um, second thing I think is having a bit of, I guess, addressing, I'd like to say, I like talking about routine generally for most people with anxiety. So I, uh, some people have been fortunate, like myself, to still be able to go to work, have income, roof over my head. So, you know, this advice does apply for everyone because everyone's going through different types of stress. But let's say if you're at home or even working from home or nothing's going on there, you need to have a routine, you know. And by routine, I mean having a time when you decide to wake up, do something, whether it's getting up to make your bed, you know, having breakfast at the same time. Because normally our lives, because of work or other commitments, we're, we're forced to, into a routine anyway. So now with coronavirus coming all over there and just dismantling the routine, everyone's now saying, oh, I can sleep till three in the, I can, you know, stay awake till three in the morning, wake up afternoon, start drinking at five, finish, you know, it's, it, it gets very unbalanced. And I think most people, just like children, work very well with structure. So having sort of a routine towards your day, and that really could be whether they wake up for yoga, a walk, a run, preparing meal prep, like, you know, actually making yourself a good meal, that takes time. So those are, that's, those are some of the things. Other things I like talking about as well is diet is quite important. So I guess exercise and diet are two, two things I like linking. Exercise makes sense. If you go out for a walk, that's sort of good. You're exercising yourself, getting your heart rate up, going out, seeing people. Because coronavirus makes people so scared, they become these hermits. And even though everyone's saying, you know, the introverts are enjoying their life now and extroverts were, were panicking because we have to be indoors. There are lots of people who are introverted generally who actually don't enjoy just being at home 
all the time. So you do need to get out there and see people. And I think if you're not, if you're aware of what coronavirus is and how it spreads, you easily can go out, social distance, and you can enjoy a workout with your, whether it's your children, your partner, or even like exercise buddy, you know? So that's something to think about. So that's exercise generally. Um, and that can be even at home. People have got, you know, the Zoom exercise happening. Yoga is quite good. Meditation. You know, it's, it's interesting how many things are thriving. And even if you want to see a therapist, you can as well, you know, because they do, they, they, they're doing Zoom and the government subsidies are still there. So now you literally can see any therapist you want. You no longer have to be pressed to say, oh, my therapist is in Parramatta or in Bondi. It's all Zoom now. So they're just there at the click of a, you know, a button. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is diet. And by diet, let me throw in alcohol as well, alcohol consumption. Uh, but diet is, it's, it's always been, people know diet is good. You know, uh, if you have a good, well-rounded diet, quite important. Um, just, you know, vegetables, just healthy. I don't even have to give you like actual particulars, but just a healthy, rounded diet. And just knowing when to eat and having routine around that, very important. And getting more water in, you know, and moving about, you know, just get everything flowing. Um, the alcohol part I bring in because now, you know, a lot of people, even people who aren't big drinkers during this time have become big drinkers, um, you know, and that's something that does, it does get away from you because I think because there's nothing planned for tomorrow. Even some people, they work at home and they don't have to do Zoom. They're just doing data, data entry. They can just be like in their pajamas drinking. So I think people start drinking a lot more than what they think they'll go through. And people start doing this panic buying where, you know, normally people would buy alcohol when maybe there's something happening or there's anticipation, but there's no desperation about it. But with coronavirus, everyone's like, oh, I should stock up. So people start getting more alcohol than they would normally. But then they also go through it quite quickly. You know, that's the thing. When you have it and you drink, you're just going to drink through it for some people. Yeah, so it uh, can get really messy. Um, yeah, and those, those, those are some of like the, the main starting points I tell people. Some excellent tips right there. And so I guess for people who have a job um, mm -hmm. and who are able to keep working and who may perhaps be feeling a little less motivated, I guess, during this time, or who are working from home, some of them. Um, what can people kind of do to stay more motivated? Oh, yeah, that's like, that's a good one. I think something I should have mentioned a bit earlier was, you know, coronavirus, the way I like to frame it for people, because, you know, I work in mental health. So you get lots of people coming to me with a lot of anxiety or mental health crisis. And obviously, during this time, it's been, you know, COVID-19 flavored, you know, that someone lost their job. They've got no money to pay for school fees or, you know, look after their children. That's a big anxiety and can make you have breakdowns. Uh, but something I was going to say about coronavirus in general, it gives people a chance to sort of restructure their lives. So, you know, when you're talking about motivation, I think if you sit back and think about it, a lot of the anxieties people get, if you actually think about what the anxiety is from, it's probably something that you already had going on before coronavirus. But because now you're at home with your own mind and your own thoughts, it comes up again. So maybe you're not in a healthy relationship. Maybe you don't even like your job. You know, you don't even like what you're studying at uni. And then it sort of comes up and you ask yourself, when this is all over, do I want to go back to that? You know, so that's something I always try and tell people that COVID-19, if you have the mental space and hopefully the resources for it, it's a good time to sort of set yourself up and actually say, actually, when this is over, what am I doing next? So when you say motivation for work, I always think it's, just to sort of address that as well, that underlying anxiety, what's actually causing anxiety during coronavirus. If you forget about coronavirus, because I think sometimes it's a bit of a distraction. Some people say, oh, no, I'm worried about my, my grandma. And this is a grandma they only call once every three months, you know? They don't even, you know, it's like, it's funny how um, easy it is to sort of get distracted with something you think is important, which you actually want holding on to as something else. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, but in terms of st staying motivated in terms of, you mean like working from home or just staying motivated for working work? from home? Because yes, yeah, sometimes, you know, when you can work from home, it's too easy to look at the couch and be like, couch is looking really good. Could just sit there. We are working from home. I found a few tips that do work for lots of people. Um, first things first, I think you have to create some sort of workspace in your actual house, your house or whatever your space is where you're living. Uh, that hopefully shouldn't be in your bedroom. Uh, it might be in the living area or maybe a quiet study room or out the veranda, whatever, balcony, whatever it is, you have to create a dedicated workspace. A space when you enter into it, it's like, oh, it's work now. You almost have to create the same, tick, um, I guess, stimulation you would have when you go to work. When you enter the office, automatically you're like, okay, we're here, security's there, camera's there, my boss is there, <laughs> you know, my colleagues are here. So you're, you're getting this very professional, um, I guess, that behavior. 
you know, you, and you, when you get to work at your computer, sure, you might mess around a bit, but you're on task, you know, and people keep bringing you work and that's how you get into that flow of work, depending on what your job is like, right? So at home, if you are working from home, definitely create a space. Um, give it as minimal distraction as possible. Most people, it really is just coming down to having a printer and their computer and maybe some notepads or files at home. And then that should be it, so as minimalist as possible. So that's, some, that's one space to start. If you live by yourself, I always think that's harder. So you have to actually catch yourself because you're your worst enemy. You know? So even I, I've found living by myself now, just to get motivated, it's just me motivating myself. There's no longer a flatmate saying, hey, we're going shopping now or we're doing this or I'm washing up in the kitchen or I'm, you know, it's, it, all these other things aren't there to keep you on task. So I think if you do live by yourself, writing it down or even setting alarms that sort of sequence what your normal day looked like when you had working at work at the office. Okay. So that way you sort of bring back that routine and get you back into a sort of, I'm working, you know, an office space. Um, if you do live with someone or even if you live next to a neighbor or friend who you associate with, it's good to keep each other on point. So let's say if you live with flatmates who are also working from home, it's good that you have your own distinct areas and also recognize when you're working, there should be minimal disruption from each. So a perfect example would be in the previous place I lived in, one of my flatmates liked, you know, playing video games uh, all the time and the other person trying to work from home in the corner. And when COVID hit, she was at home a lot more frequently. He was still playing video games because uh, he used to work from home all the time at weird hours. But she had to, had to have this discussion and saying, listen, this is not my work time. You can't play games. And yeah, she was okay. You know, it was a very reasonable person. He just thought that she was able to block out the noise, but she wasn't. So you need to talk to each other about what your distractions are. You probably might have similar break times maybe. And just knowing when you can just sit back, have a chat, then go back to work. That's really good. I find if you've got a buddy system, even if they don't live with you, someone who texts you or calls you and said, listen, you work until 11, I'll call you then, just have a bit of a chat, have a snack or water, then get back into it. That's really important. Um, also a good idea to also, if you can't avoid like, um, what's the word I'm going to say? Snacking at home. Because I think that's the tricky one. It's like, it's, it's kind of a trap when you're working. You're sort of loading yourself up with carbs and carbs. So you get these energy spikes, but then you sort of start crash quite early. Because I think I actually... I, I don't know if this is true, it's more anecdotal. I think more people are snacking at home because you've got everything at home. You don't, you don't have to get dressed. You've got your chips right there. We're at work. If you go into the kitchen, it's usually around the snack time, office tea time, or smoke goes, whatever the break might be. And that's something we should have to sort of keep in mind. But once again, it's all about routine. And um, something I did, didn't highlight earlier was just making goals. So like actual work goals. Like today, let's say for you, today was let's do this interview. Let's set a time, you talk to me, we've got this time period, this is our goal. And once you've done that, you can tick it off. And then you have a sense of achievement. Because yes. it's very easy for these work from home days to just feel monotonous. Well, the meme saying is like, today is yesterday, was tomorrow, was today is this day. You know, like every day is the same. So you kind of have to try and give yourself these sort of gold stars almost that you did well for the day. Yeah, that's right. Reward yourself. Mm -hmm. Say, good job, me. <laughs> yes, yeah, you have to be your hype man. You have to be your own hype person in COVID. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, mm. And I, I really like what you said um, before just about um, this is a really good time to be thinking, not, I guess, necessarily of so far in the future, but like where you are now and kind of what you really enjoy and what you really want to be doing or what you had been doing in the past. So can we kind of talk a little bit more about um, I guess perks isn't really the greatest word, but like the, the, the positives, if you, if, you do, if you don't want to look at the negatives of coronavirus, which are, there's a lot, um, but mm -hmm. kind of the things we can be looking at during this yeah. time. Okay. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I like putting things, gosh, you know, it's funny having this interview reminds me of just being at, at work because I have a discussion all the time with people because mm -hmm. it's something that comes up quite frequently. So I usually like talking about having different domains or portions of your life that everyone has, but then you have to just sort of phrase them differently and look at them. So something I, I think I always talk about is your relationship to these domains. By these domains, I mean work, family, friends, uh, partners, or intimate, whoever you, you're having a relationship with, you know? And those are the type of, for the most part, those are people who you end up dealing with. Those are domains you get to deal with a lot. And the last one should also be about yourself. What's your relationship with yourself, which is yeah. very important. Very important, so, yeah. Yeah, and I think during um, coronavirus, if you just, if during this time anyway, or any time really, this should, you should do this all the time. It's not just now in the pandemic. To <laughs> but I think 
have looking at the positives of saying, okay, at work, let's say you've been, um, let's say, I guess, this applies more, I guess, people who actually still have employment, I guess, right now and are working from home or just have something. Um, there, you feel more, what's the word I was going to use? I think more grateful for being in, having work. You feel, you feel definitely privileged. Definitely that's the word I would use right now. If you have a job and you're holding on to something and you haven't been let go or made redundant, that's good. But then as well, a lot of people are now, the jobs they really hated, they're now like, okay, they kept me, so I'm going to stay loyal to this job I really, really hate. You know, and you have to ask yourself, and a lot of anxiety that might come up during this, this time would be about work. So some people are getting really stressed about work. Not so much even about being made redundant or are you an essential worker. It's more how much they really don't like their job. This thing come up, come up you know, they, they're working from home and they're just not motivated. They're getting all these emails, these passive aggressive remarks, this your friends been let off. You know, I think if your work environment was toxic, it even becomes more toxic. Like the way we're talking about now, people at home who are trapped with their abusers and domestic violence relationships, something similar. So it's something where you want to sit back and say, actually, I've got time to maybe look at the future because there's lots of job opportunities that are going to come up because there's been a big disruption. So when things open up again, there'll be more people hiring for different spots and you have to ask yourself, do I really want to be in this position or is this something that I can look for that, look forward past this, you know? And now's the time to actually sit down and think about it. You don't have to super achieve and do anything, but just pivoting a bit might help with that. Um, the other relationships I usually bring up as well are with family and friends. So family, I guess, you know, sometimes you're stuck with them, whether it's good or bad, that's a different story. But like, let's say, I like giving an example of myself instead of talking about other people. You know, it's probably very closer to my brother and sister because now we spend lots of time at home and you can't really, no one's really got the excuse saying that, oh, I'm busy tonight because there's not much open, you know? And after a while watching all of Netflix, you really have your evenings where you're doing nothing. Uh, not everyone, but a lot of people have lots of free time. So if, you don't, if you're not able to reach out to people, maybe you just don't like that person, you know? And that's something you have to challenge because sometimes people always tell me, or oh, my friends don't listen to me, or that's a bad friend. But also like flipping it on people. You're probably a bad friend to someone as well. You just might not know who that is. You know, there's someone who's trying to reach out to you during coronavirus, but you're just like, ah, oh, you see that text and you don't respond back. But they might really need you, but you've become the bad friend because you just can't have space for them. And that's something to be aware of. You know, and I think really focusing on those, those relationships, especially with friends and family, asking yourself which ones are giving me energy and which ones are taken away from me. And why? You know, you have to ask yourself, and that's where I think it becomes quite difficult. If you've got a friend who you think is your best friend, then during coronavirus, you realize that your relationship actually is quite shallow and superficial. It was good at some point, but now it's not really a good relationship. You have to ask yourself, should I work on this or is it something I need to let go? You know, and I think that's where people's anxiety comes in, feeling helpless and useless during this time, this pandemic. You know, but really, I always tell when the power is actually in your hands, you actually can reach out. People are actually happy to reconcile during this time. And even if you're going to move on, it's something to, yeah, it's something for you to be aware of. You make yourself, a, getting yourself involved in healthier relationships. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, and I think the last two, I should have said, oh, I guess there's so many, but <laughs> relationships <laughs> yeah. with partners, right? So I guess I'm sort of like cons- giving you a concise version of the, yeah. the whole speech I usually give people. But let's say a relationship with partners. It's interesting during this time that, that there have been quite a lot of, partners who everyone's talking about, oh, they're getting over their, their partners, they're breaking up. That's definitely happening. Uh, but there are actually some partners who have actually seen them got better before now, you know? Before they were always arguing, but now because of coronavirus, it's just giving them perspective and said, actually, I do love you as a partner. We need to treat each other better. Let's work on this. You know, there are those positive stories and everyone has the power to do that. But just be aware it's a two-way street. You shouldn't be the one who's trying to pull the whole relationship, you know? It's a, it has to be both. Mm-hmm. And during this time, couples now have more time to be with each other's space and realize, actually, these things I like about you, these things sort of annoy me, and that's why I get grumpy or irritable. I'm just saying it like in just a very, you know, non-attacking way, just stating what's going on, but ultimately you can make a stronger relationship. The flip side of that is people who are in bad relationships, and I guess I'm not talking bad, like pull on maybe domestic violence bad just yet, but just unhealthy relationships, very toxic, manipulative, you know, that sort of type of relationship. It really does intensify that. And then people now with the pandemic, I think people aren't always staying in these toxic relationships as much because now, because of just the way coronavirus is marketed to everyone, everyone thinks that they might die. You know? And if you think you might die, a lot of people have told me, if I die tomorrow, this person I'm with, was this, was this the best I could get as a partner? You know? And that's like a big question to ask yourself. 
I mean, it's also giving yourself a big up that you deserve better than what you have, you know, so you're sort of putting yourself in a higher standing, which you might be, but just so might not be. That might be what, just what you can get. So something to think about with that. Um, it's what you can get. Yeah, no, seriously, because, you know, that's why mental health is funny, because you have to give people the good, but then you have to sort of flip it and say, you know, everyone wants a good partner. Like, if you go on all these um, dating websites or apps, yeah, it's apps always the same. All these things. Everyone's happy-go-lucky, they travel, they're really nice, they're very accommodating. I'm like, wow, those are very unrealistic things, but I guess it's the hook. Really what it should be is, I aim to be this type of person, but sometimes I'm this. I can be passive-aggressive and moody when this happens, when I'm stressed, you know? <laughs> but that wouldn't make a very good dating profile, you know? But that'd be the truth. <laughs> you know, every time I read the dating profile that says, uh, happy-go-lucky or easy-going, I'm like, ah. Oh, can't be that easygoing, you know? <laughs> you almost want to see someone write something truthful, like, generally, I can get by okay, but I've got these nitpicky things. I don't like greens, uh, party, I, you know, I like people, you know? <laughs> Just like, you know? Some truthful those, things. <laughs> yeah, the truthful things. But when people read those truthful things, what a reason we're like, oh, that sounds like we're going to have conflict already. Mm-hmm. Yet, you're going to have conflict with anyone you get into a relationship with anyway. You know? So it's just a good time, I think, to review relationships, especially intimate relationships. And if you have kids as well, that's also bringing up a lot because now you've got some partners who want like the main carer, like I guess in the big stereotype, I'm going to do like um, say heteronormative example. You've got a man and a woman, the stereotype is mom has kids. Mom usually does a lot of the caring day-to-day stuff, you know, uh, where dad sort of comes home, can do jokes, but does work, makes the, gets the bacon, even that's changing quite a lot. Mm-hmm. But now they're home, the person who's the non-carer is now realizing the deficiencies they have with their children. And some of my friends have told me, wow, you know, I appreciate my wife so much. I didn't realize there was so much work in caring for a kid, you know? I think people realize it. They think it's a lot to care for a kid. Then you're, when you're actually doing the caring, if you're the non-primary care, if you're, let's say, secondary care, if you want to say that, mm-hmm. um, it really ups the stakes. And I think it's really made people appreciative of their, their partners, at the same time also get frustrated with their children because they realize they don't spend that much time with them. Mm-hmm. And then, the, you know, if your kid's there and he's just asking you questions and one of my friends was saying, gosh, this, this kid just asks a lot. He was worried about his kid's intelligence. But I'm like, do you do the homework with your son? Mm-hmm. Are you trying to, you know, what, what expectations are you raising from this kid who you don't get in, who you're not involved with? You know, so that's something that coronavirus does, but it's like we're able to distract it because we don't want to listen to that negative and I guess anxiety. Anxiety is usually portrayed as quite negative in every culture, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's why I think whenever someone has something negative going on, so even all these points I've mentioned work, partners, relationship, children, people feel that, but it it brings up these very uncomfortable uh, feelings. I don't have a serious talk to my parents about this Uh, now. Nah, you know, it's just too. Now's not the time, let's just survive COVID, which is a valid excuse, but at the end of the day, it's still not addressing the real issue. Um, and that, I guess, leads it up to the last thing where having a relationship with, your, with yourself mm. is quite important. And that's always a tricky one, because let let, let's say if I give you that example, Sharon, actually, because I'm talking a lot, I realize. <laughs> um, I had to ask you, Sharon, what's your relationship with yourself mm. you know, during COVID-19? What things, if you're happy to talk about anything, I have to have yeah, it yeah. for you. Yeah, mine, mine, it has been pretty good. I think it's better now. I think in the beginning, I was like, what is the situation? Very confused. What's going to happen? And then once we got, you know, these are the restrictions, I kind of would see like the structure because, you know, you really, once you know that there's a thing that you can and can't do, it's like, okay, I feel a bit better that I know what's happening. So then once I was kind of able to get over all that, um, I was kind of like, Hey, this is a really good time. Like I found there was just a little bit of brain space kind of free. It's like, I'm not commuting as much. I get to work. I am very thankful that I get to work from home and I still have my job. And so I, I, I have these kind of a few extra like 40 minutes or so that I would normally be on the train. Now it's like, Hey, I kind of have that to myself. I can think a little bit more. I can kind of, you know, claim it back in a way and just, kind of have that time for me. And I really appreciate that. And it's something I guess I never really thought of before this yes. whole situation. Then you're like, yeah, I have this extra time. And I guess it really makes me see, you know, 
kind of enjoyable things. Like when I go for walks around my own like neighborhood, I'm like, hey, I found this really cool park. And you know, cause I work so much and I don't really have the time to just be walking around my neighborhood all the time. Yep. And now I'm like, now I can do it. And it's great. So it's like, I'm just noticing these like little things and it's, it's just something that I enjoy. So it's like, hey, I really like doing this. I really like walking around, seeing some greenery. And yeah, so I think the relationship with myself, it's more of realizations, like a little bit more time to think, a little bit yes. time to walk around, a little more time to enjoy just, yeah, being outside or just being inside by myself. It's just really nice. Yes. Oh, good. Now you've definitely had a, a good transition. I, I like that. The, the beginning anxiety, which we all had, no one <laughs> should be saying that when COVID was coming big, it's like, oh, no, nothing. I think in the beginning, maybe we were dismissive, but once it came yeah. full force, yeah. we were talking about lockdowns, all of us, you know, you're looking at people, even if someone coughs, like, <laughs> they're clearing <laughs> their throat. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, we can break paranoid. You know, if you hear coughing, even in our house, we have flatmates, hear someone coughing, like, oh, no. Oh. And then it's like, you have fever, they're mm-hmm. getting tested. Mm-hmm. You, you almost feel like that's what's next. Uh, but after a while, you're right. I think the big things that do come out are, you find you have time because literally you're not going anywhere. So no pubs, no socializing, you're, you're reducing commuting time. So you've got a lot, of, a lot more extra time than people give themselves credit for because we usually squander it with procrastination. Yes. I think people have discovered how well they can procrastinate. Oh, yeah. You know, because now you've got all the time to do the work. Even the same work you're doing from home, you've actually got more time to do it because technically you can start earlier. You've got no distractions from that colleague who's always talking in your ear. You know, you know then you're not really as efficient, really. You, you know, it's like, wow, I've got more time, less distractions. I know what work I'm supposed to do. I am not doing it efficiently. You know, and that's, um, that leads on to what you're talking about, being mental space. Because mm-hmm. now you don't have many engagements. People are sort of distracted, looking after themselves. Mm-hmm. So you left your own devices. And it's good to actually realize that having that sort of extra mental space is good for us. So mm-hmm. we can appreciate the small things like taking a walk in the park. Like, I walk quite a lot. And I realize, actually, I don't mind walking. Yeah. You know? That's great. Actually, you look at the trees. I'm like, okay, nature, I see what you're doing. Yeah. You know, I even appreciate the people who were jogging before. This is what you guys were experiencing? Okay. You know? <laughs> yeah. you, we always knew that was important, right? Walking and getting out there, exercise, but you, don't, you didn't give yourself the mental space for it. Mm-hmm. Now, the trick becomes when all the lockdowns go away and all those same distractions, commuting, work goes back to normal. I mean, if you're in the position to go back to work, whatever, it's how are you able to keep some of that for yourself? And then you realize how much you sacrifice you know, you see in all these self-help books, any self-help meme, the same, like keeping space for yourself. And it's hard to do. You have to, you're going back to working at the office. They're saying, listen, we've been behind. Now everyone's going to be cranking down and staff to get the numbers out. We need to get back on track. We've made financial losses. it will be very easy to creep up on what you were doing before and not go for walks. Mm. Do the same sort of, yeah, you know, just not look after yourself. Um, so that, that's what I was saying. Like the uh, relationship you have with yourself is quite important to review. And even I've had a few friends who are actually thinking when they go back, they're going to go back to part-time work um, just because they realize full-time, they just can't get their break. But if you go part-time, maybe working uh, four days a week, they're finding that I can survive. And on part-time pay, you know, all of us have been spending less. Like even I've managed to make savings, which makes me realize how much I was spending on going out and socializing. Yeah. So now you, you know, you realize, wow, I was not good with money. Or you, so, so you can live up far less than what you were living on before. So that means you don't need the money. Mm-hmm. And I guess that sort of feeds into lots of things about, you know, capitalism and making us work till we die if you want to go into that world of thinking. But yeah, it, it's a good time to sort of reframe, have space for yourself and come out the other side. Mm-hmm. And I, I know we spoke about this last time. The thing is with all this talk, it puts lots of pressure on people to come out more amazing post COVID, you know, it's like come out better, better looking, cooking well, man, it's like, you're going to be on top of the world. You're ready. I've got friends who have been taking university courses online. I'm coming back with it, you know, with the court, with the, with the certificate. I'm like, good. If you can do that, good on you. But the minimum I ask any person is if you can just maintain your mental health and physical health through COVID, if you can survive it with or without the work, that's enough. That in itself would be enough. If you can just keep your health and mental health stable during this time. When you come out the other side, I guarantee you, you'll be on ahead of a lot of other people, mm. you know? Where, so don't try and get too caught up in this. I have to do this and that. And that. You know, this is, it's so easy to do. Yeah. Um, and some people can do it, but not everyone. So don't feel stressed about it at all. Yeah. 
And you know, that is actually such a perfect way to end a really great interview. Thank you so much, Xavier. Some good tips. Yeah, no, definitely. <laughs>